to revive our oceans, we need to think about things differently. Do we want to continue as we are? Or do we want to have a rethink and change the way we do things? If we honestly believe that we've collectively damaged this planet, then surely we should try our best to put it right. Any young person who might come up to me in another 10 years time and say, didn't you know about it? Yeah? We do know about it. Well, give them a fucking chance. Do some bloody good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that sums it up. Right? Yeah. The family, there's seven of us. You know, this is Owen and Shemaine's children and then partners of, which I'm one of. We wanted to come up with something that we can improve our coastal environment and people's well-being. Those are the two core values for us. This thing of for the love of the sea kept coming up and we wanted to find out is there like one word that we could use for that. And Curry Moore was what was born out of that, which was amazing. And I was speaking to a really nice man from Pembrokeshire who started the Pembrokeshire Beach Food Company. And he was wondering why no one was growing seaweed in Wales. And when I told him my dad was a shellfish farmer, he was just like, get your dad on it. And uh, luckily for Carrie Moore and seaweed, dad wasn't working at this point. So we looked into seaweed, we looked into Green Wave, and we were just amazed by how amazing this form of food production seemed. It almost seemed so good to be true that we were just a bit like, this is we've got to do it. Look at the growth of this. It's just like, the sexiest seaweed ever. I used to come down here on holiday when I was a kid, and you come here now, 50 years later, and you look out and you think, well, it hasn't changed, has it? You know? But what we can't see is happening underneath, the acidification, the chemical characteristics of the sea, the increasing temperature. And you know, I think that's part of the trouble, is that people can't see it, so they don't think there's a problem. When the licensing for the seaweed farm was taking so long, I took a job with a government agency to help fishermen during those couple of years from the research and from talking to people. I don't think there's any doubt that the catches have significantly dropped over the last 30 or 40 years. When I was really small, about, about two years of age, my father decided to sort of come down and fish a small trawler and did that for about 15 years. The trawler you had was a bottom trawler. You've got a net which basically drags along the bottom of the seabed with all the fish then what's disturbed on the bottom of the sea then sort of gets caught in the nets, which does disrupt and disturb the bottom. So if there's anything growing on the seabed, whether it's grass or there's sort of corals, it tended to just sort of destroy the whole sort of shift then. I mean, it does replenish, but that takes a long time. I certainly noticed it here as a kid, even as, as, a, as a young kid growing up the reduction in stock over the years, which led to my father eventually stopping doing it. It wasn't sustainable for himself. The reason for why it's called sugar kelp is when it gets light, when it dries up on the sand, it's when it gets that white powdery dust on it. That looks like powdered sugar. I remember as a kid just going down to the harbour and fishermen bringing like tons of tons of fish back on the boats and then you could still go and pick your fish off the boat and be like, I want that one. Where now there's hardly anything there's almost a tenth, if not even less, amount of fishermen out there on their boats because there's just nothing left. And so when we started talking about creating Carrymore, this was to improve our coastal environment. That was very important to us because we remember what that was like when we were all growing up and how the sea life was so rife. What can we do to improve things like that? And by having an ocean farm, that creates its own habitat and nurseries, then you surely will kind of revive that again and improve the environment that's there. So the beauty of these ocean farms is that we can battle climate change with it. With the seaweeds and mussels and oysters, we can offset CO2, take out excess nutrients out of the water, like nitrates and phosphates. It's one of the most sustainable ways of growing crops. We don't need land, we don't need fresh water, we don't need pesticides and we don't need fertilizer. 
not only during the growth of seaweed we have an impact, after growth we have a massive impact on different industries, like the food industry, meat industry, food for cattle. And on the other hand, we can create biostimulants, bioplastics. It's a super versatile crop. The impact is bigger than you think. So what we're trying to do is harvest about two tons of oilweed um, to dry the clegge and then um, go to the Netherlands to make um, flower pots of. We estimated there'd be about six to seven tons out there, so we'll try and get two today. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. A lot of seaweed. Then. A lot of seaweed. Now, the concept of an ocean farm is a bit difficult for people to sometimes understand. And the way that I like to explain it is that if you were to walk down the coast path now and you look out to the sea, you're going to see lines with buoys just floating on top of the water. What you don't see underneath these lines is what's actually growing there. You'll have long lines of seaweed that's suspended from the ropes. And in between those, you'll have lantern nets that's then filled with oysters. And down at the bottom of the ocean, we've got big cages that's got scallops in them. Also between the buoys, you'll have these thick ropes that mussels are growing on. That's kind of what a 3D ocean farm is. And the idea of the seaweed and the shellfish growing together, it just creates this beautiful underwater garden where other marine species can come in and they can get food, they can get protection, it can be a good breeding ground. You put a couple of lines and some boys and it, it just creates like an extraordinary overgrown hedgerow, absolutely full of life, teeming with life. The beauty of the seaweed lines is the natural settlement of other seaweeds that grow beautifully out here in this A-grade water um, with at least 12 metres of water underneath it. We got sea lettuce, we got dulse, and there's lava all along the lines as well, which is uh, fabulous. No sand in them, nothing. Perfect for the food market. And obviously bringing all the environmental benefits where before the ropes and things, there was nothing growing out here at all. So all good news, yeah. The idea of Karimo might have started with a family, but you know we would not be here if it wasn't for the community and volunteers and everyone that got involved. Once you know the word kind of spread a little bit more, more and more people wanted to be part of this and, and realized what potential this has. We have over 150 people that's part of this, members, volunteers, investors, people that really see the potential of this. I suppose the main jobs around here currently are farming and tourism, but before it would have had a really buzzing fishing industry. Fishing as a tradition, you just see it dying out, you know, it's usually handed down through generations. But there are lots of boats that have slowed down, that have been sold, generations have not passed that down. People have gone, moved away from the area, or there's other employment in the area, there's a lot of seasonal work here. Definitely something that's really important to me for Carrie Moore is about joining and then hopefully improving the fishing industries. So when there's only one fisherman going out of each harbour and his son doesn't want to be a fisherman, then we're in danger of losing all of these skills. I would love for Carrie Moore to continue creating jobs that do enable people to go out and to connect directly with the environment because I think it's quite simple changes that need to happen that will help people feel better within themselves and then better about the world around them. We are now just trying to get as much air into the plants so they will start the drying process and tomorrow we'll be all around drying. After that's done, it will be transported to Holland and together with my partners there, we will refine it to biostimulants for tulip bulbs and bioplastic. So for instance, this is a biodegradable um, injection molded flower pot. In particular from us, we, we are using it for, for food products, we are using it for bioplastics, we are using it for fertilizers, we are making beers with it, we are making cosmetics with it. 
Uh, so it's, it's mind blowing to think that um, something that actually just grows out on its own in the sea can be used for so many applications. To revive our oceans, we need to think about things differently. Nothing is just a cookie-cutter solution and an easy fix. It'll never be, but we have to start somewhere. And I think by starting with a 3D ocean farm, I think we can have a huge impact on that. By creating habitats for our fish, which has been overfished, there's nothing left anymore. By creating nurseries, and small habitats, we can try and replenish that and start rebuilding that again. In the long haul, we could really make a big change in climate to grow the crops that are locally occurring in different kinds of places all around the world. And if we can do that on a very sustainable scale and scale up gently, then we can work together with the ecosystem and not damage it any more further. I hope that, you know, in not the too distant future to see more and more of these up and down the coast and hopefully by what we're trying to do here right now that we can pave the way for that to happen. <laughs>